This is, uh, this is the book of Philemon. It's an actual, an entire book in the New Testament. You can go home today and say, hey, I read a whole book of the Bible. Uh, and you don't have to tell them, it's only 460 words long. Uh, and we're going to be reading this in a minute. So I'd like to just hold off. I'd like to give an introduction uh, to what's going on here before we read our text. This is actually not a sermon this morning. It's a Bible study. So we're going to do a little Bible study here and learn about this particular passage. Paul wrote this letter in prison, like he did uh, many of the letters of the New Testament. He was in jail in Rome. He wasn't there for a parking ticket. He was uh, charged with treason, treachery against the Roman Empire. He was uh, on death row. And the courts, like today's courts, were backed up. And he was waiting for his court date to come for him to be tried. Um, And he writes this letter to a man who lived in Colossae, Greece, named Philemon. We, we think he was a wealthy man because he had a house that was big enough for the church to meet in. They met in his house. And when Paul went to Colossae, he preached, he converted some people, he started a church there, and included in that group was this man, Philemon. Um, let me just say a little bit that this is, this is very much how the Bible is written. The Bible is written to particular people in particular places to certain churches, usually. It's rare to have a personal letter like this in, in, in there. But it was written, uh, the Bible is what you call prescriptive literature. It was written to address a certain concern or problem that was going on. And Paul used his letters to try to get the Christians on the right track in certain ways. And um, this is, Earl Palmer points out that this is very, very important when you're analyzing scripture, to understand the context that was being addressed in this place. When you don't do that, you can get in trouble. For example, in the letter to the Corinthians, in in the church in Corinth, there were some women, a small group of women, who were fighting amongst each other. and, And they were causing some trouble. And so Paul wrote in the letter to the Corinthians, don't let the women speak in church. And so what happened over the years was that that particular admonition to that one church was universalized. So that you have actual denominations like the one I grew up in, the Church of Christ or the Southern Baptists, that will not allow women to be ministers because of that one particular verse to that one church. They universalized it. That's not good. You're not supposed to take other people's prescriptions. You're supposed to make sure that you have the same thing. And so, and so it's very important to understand the context here of what's going on. Paul doesn't sit down every day and say, hey, I think I'll write, write a few more pages in the Bible. That's not how it goes. He addresses particular situations and concerns. So here's the situation with this one. Paul's in jail in Rome, and he meets a runaway slave named Onesimus. Back then, they didn't have individual cells. You just threw a bunch of people together in the dungeon and you were in jail. And um, Paul used the opportunity of being in jail to preach. In fact, he said, you know, when you're a preacher, jail's not a bad thing because you've got a captive audience. (laughs) No, they can't go anywhere. And in fact, he actually brags in one of his, his letters. He says, because I've been in jail... Half of the Praetorian Guard has been converted and are now Christians. They're they're Christians. You have brothers and sisters in the Praetorian Guard because I've been able to preach to them and convert them in jail. So Onesimus, this runaway slave, is also converted. And in the course of their conversation, well, you can imagine the conversation. They're talking there. uh, What's your name, Paul? What's your name, Onesimus? What you in for, Paul? Preaching? What are you in for, Onesimus? Well, I'm a runaway slave. Oh, where are you from? Onesimus says, Colossae. Colossae, Turkey. Paul says, I've been to Colossae. In fact, I started a church there. Who was your owner? And Onesimus says, Philemon. Paul says, I know Philemon. 
I know that guy. I converted him. I know him very well. He's in the church there. So small world in this Roman jail. The time comes for Philemon, for, excuse me, Onesimus to be returned to Philemon. In those days, they actually didn't punish the slaves themselves directly. They just took you back to your owner, and the owner was allowed to punish the slaves. And you were able, the most common punishment was crucifixion. Another common one was to have a, a large F branded on your forehead, which meant fugitivus. A slave, it, was, it wasn't murder to kill a slave. They were property. And so he's going to be sent back to Philemon, and Paul sits down, and he writes a letter that Onesimus is going to take with him to give to Philemon and the church there. And that's the letter that we're going to read right here. Okay. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all good, that is ours in Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an ambassador and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him in order that he might serve me in your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back for even longer, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. May the Lord bless to our hearts and our minds this reading of his word. A couple notes on this text. Do you notice right at the beginning there? In those days, you don't sign your name at the end of the letter. You sign it at the beginning. So it says, to Philemon from Paul. So you know right off at the very beginning who it's to and who it's from. The first thing Paul does in his letter is he compliments Philemon. A lot, which is a pretty smart thing to do when you're going to ask a favor, right? He gives him a lot of compliments uh, and uh, says nice things about him. There's an interesting little thing in verse 11. It's a play on words, a pun. In Greek, a name is not just a name, but it has a meaning. We don't have this so much in English, but um, the name Onesimus actually means useful. And so Paul has that little line where he says, he was useless to you. So, so Onesimus, useful, was useless to you, but now he's useful again, because I'm sending him back. So it's a little kind of a pun that you would only understand if you got the Greek connotation of the name there. And then 
we acknowledge the fact that Onesimus was not just a runaway, but he was probably a thief. Because if you're a slave and you own nothing, and, you're, and you leave, you run away, you probably have to steal some stuff to fund your journey. So Onesimus may have stolen anything that he could to take with him when he ran away, because he made it all the way from Turkey to Rome, quite a ways. So he had to have some money to get there and to fund his journey. And so Paul offers Philemon, he, he offers to pay anything that Onesimus owes to Philemon. He makes that offer, which I love. I think that's fun, because how do you collect from a guy on death row? How's he going to get the money from him? But he says, he says it to him. He says that. Um, and then my favorite is when he says, you know, charge me, you know, if he owes you anything. But then he says, but I remind you, you owe your very self to me. Isn't that rich? You owe yourself to me. Your, your faith is because of me. So if you want to charge me, go ahead. But just remember, you owe yourself to me. This is a masterpiece of persuasion. If I was a, in trouble, I'd want Paul to be my attorney. He was good. How does he persuade Philemon? Three different things he tries. First of all, Paul uses guilt. You know, guilt is a good thing sometimes. There's bad guilt, neurotic guilt, but there's also good guilt. If you do something bad and you feel guilty, that's good. That means you're not a sociopath. But, you know, there are some cases where guilt is an appropriate response to something, and Paul uses it here. He says, remember... You owe your very self to me. I remember seeing this uh, card one time, and a greeting card, and it was from a company called the Jewish Mother Greeting Card Company. And it had a picture of this little old lady sitting on a couch by herself in a room. And the, and the front of the card said, it's okay, you don't have to come visit me. And on the inside it said, I only gave birth to you. <laughs> Good guilt. Good guilt. Paul uses it. Secondly, peer pressure. Did you notice, notice that the letter is not just addressed to Philemon? It was addressed to the church. And like most of Paul's letters, it was meant to be read aloud in worship. So can you imagine the day that it comes and the, the church is all gathered there at the house and somebody stands up and reads the letter. Everyone looks over at Philemon. What's it going to be, huh? What are you going to do, Philemon? And then he, thirdly, he uses the threat of follow-up. He says, get a room ready for me, because I'm going to come. And when I come, I don't want to see any big F branded on Onesimus' forehead. I'm going to come and check on him. I think he just made that up because two other places, Paul says that if, if he gets out of jail, he's going to Spain, which is the opposite direction, total opposite direction. Um, but he doesn't get out anyway. Two years later, he was killed outside the gates of Rome. You know, this passage brings up kind of an interesting question. Why didn't Paul condemn the institution of slavery? Why didn't he take the opportunity? I mean, we all pretty much agree that slavery, slavery is a morally bankrupt institution, right? And so why didn't Paul condemn that? In fact, you know that the southern churches in the Civil War days, they used this scripture to justify owning slaves. They said God is not against slavery. Paul sent Onesimus back to his owner to be, continue to be a slave. They use this to justify their holding of slaves. We don't know exactly, but at the time that this was written, there were approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Slavery was a very part of the fabric of life. Even the advanced Greek democratic society of Aristotle and Plato, slavery was assumed. They had democracy, but only if you were free, rich, and male. Perhaps Paul knew that it just wasn't time yet. That if Christianity incited a slave rebellion, rebellion, millions of people would be murdered. It took 1,800 years until Christians, and I'm glad that it was Christians, who began 
the abolition of slavery in the 1800s, people like David Livingston, William Wilberforce, John Brown, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, those kind of people who began the movement to abolish this hideous thing called slavery. So instead of instituting a new socio-political order, Paul introduces a new relationship between human beings in which all of the external differences are abolished. He writes this, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free, but all are one. That is so radical. Breaking down the barriers of society, economic and gender and social barriers, to have a slave and a slave owner sitting beside themselves worshiping God was an unheard of thing. And Paul was the beginning to, to institute this sort of society in the world. So what does this mean for us now, 2,000 years later? I can think of a few lessons for us, for our lives from this. First thing is, make sure you pay attention to the little people in your life. Remember the uh, New York hotel owner, Leona Helmsley? She, they called her the queen of mean because she denigrated the little people. This reminds us that whatever, wherever a person is on the lower end of the economic scale, make sure you treat the people that bust your tables and bring you your food and ring up your cash register, make sure you treat those people with great dignity and respect. Paul did, and he encourages us to do that as well. The th second thing we need to learn from this text is that beautiful things can be born in a prison cell. Here this beautiful thing came out of that worst of circumstances. I know some of you feel like you're living in, in a prison. Some of you are in a relationship that is so problematic that it feels like a prison. Some of you long for a relationship to come into your life, and your prison is loneliness. For some of you, the prison is, is a disease that you're battling and fighting in, in that situation. For some of you, it's having a job which is utterly meaningless, and you go to it every day, and you wonder why you're there. So, Paul speaks from his prison cell to yours to remind you that God can grow roses in prison and new beginnings can happen. The third takeaway is that everybody deserves a second chance. You hear people talk nowadays about zero tolerance, one strike you're out. That's not the Bible. That's not the gospel. In the Bible, people that are murderers, like David and Moses, are used by God and given a second chance. People have many chances. It's called grace. So when you need to forgive someone and give them a second chance, just remember, that's what the Bible encourages you to do. If you're an employer and you have a chance to hire a felon, remember this text. Remember what it says. And then, fourthly, expect the best of people. When you expect the best, often they, they rise to that level. Paul wrote to Philemon, I'm sure that you will do what I ask. In fact, I'll, I know that you'll do even more than I ask. He expects him to do the best, and we hope he does. Now, the question is, what happened? We don't know. This is all we have. We have no knowledge of what happened when Onesimus got back to Philemon. We have no idea the end of this story. But there's one interesting historical footnote. In the letters of Ignatius, one of the early church fathers, a little bit later, he wrote these letters to the different churches and he addressed them to the different bishops of the different churches. And one of the letters is addressed to the Bishop of Ephesus. And the Bishop of Ephesus had an unusual name. It was a slave name. His name was Onesimus. We don't know for sure, but it's possible that Onesimus went on to become a bishop in the early church. Well, some scholars think that's likely because why else would this letter have been preserved? 
Paul must have written hundreds of personal letters. Why is this one in the Bible? Why was it adopted into the canon? Unless there was a famous bishop somewhere that thought it ought to be included and thought it was pretty important. Paul speaks from his jail cell to wherever you are in your life. And he encourages you to remember all those things that we've just talked about. Amen.